We're at the Panda Conference, which is a gathering of people primarily from the U.S. who are interested in this topic. And it's been a very interesting meeting so far. Um, we've had some presentations that have talked about the basic science of this, so trying to understand the mechanism by which some injury might occur. And uh, there have been some real advances, I think, over the uh, recent past without getting into too much detail. But it's looking more and more like anesthesia may be associated with some defect or injury to the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell, uh, which causes some compounds that may damage other parts of cellular activity. So we certainly don't understand everything about how this might happen, but it does look like various labs are, are coming together about some common mechanisms that may be um, involved in anesthetic neurotoxicity, which is a really important finding uh, because if we can really figure out what might be causing this, this helps us to look more effectively in people to see if it's actually occurring in people as well. So I think there's been some really good progress on the basic science front. Uh, we haven't yet heard from the clinical people uh, who are trying to answer the important question of it seems to happen in animals, but does it really happen in children or not? Um, but we do have some evidence that uh, the progress in that area is also quite good. We've gotten some dental anesthesia in very young infants that were undergoing herniorrhaphy. That suggested that at least for the endpoint that they've looked at so far at age two years, there wasn't any difference in outcome between children who had a spinal versus general, which is very reassuring in terms of um, the idea that maybe one single relatively brief exposure is not associated with injury. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're continuing to make progress. Uh, we still really don't know though, and I think that's one of the main things that we're here at the conference to try to discuss is what's the next step. I think that there's good consensus that we're continuing to move forward, but there's still a ways to go before we get to the answer, and that there's really going to need to be a lot more research uh, and a lot more support for the research so that we can come up with better answers to the question of whether exposure to anesthesia in fact does affect the brains of babies. Science works by slowly accumulating different kinds of evidence, some in animals, some in people, some a combination of the two, and at the end of the day you try to put all that evidence together and come up with what you think is the best answer available to you at the time. And so we're just going through this process. Uh, this happens to be a little more difficult than some of the other things that uh, science has tried to answer because of some of the limitations of, of the experiments that we can or can't apply to children. But uh, I think everything's actually going very well. Um, I think we're, we're very thoughtfully uh, considering what the steps of the process should be. Every year we get a little more evidence that helps us to have a little more clear understanding. And we're not there yet, but again with science we're seldom really ever absolutely there. This is just how this process works. Yeah, my name is uh, Charlie DiMaggio. I'm a professor of surgery and population health at New York University Langone School of Medicine. And prior to that, I was associate professor of anesthesiology and epidemiology at Columbia University. I was part of the PANDA team with Dr. Sun, Dr. Lee, Dr. Ying, that did some of the uh, first clinical uh, research on the issue of uh, anesthetic neurotoxicity in young children. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here, and it's despite the fact that it's been really seven years or so, seven to eight years since the first clinical studies came out, and uh, more on the order of 10 or 12 years since the first preclinical studies come out, in terms of population health and public health, it's been a rather remarkable, remarkably rapid advance in knowledge. And this kind of symposium, this get together, allows folks from the preclinical studies, folks that are doing clinical work, policymakers, stakeholders, to all come together and share these advances and discuss where we should be going next. To my view, I think the work has been advancing so rapidly, the challenge now is really to make sense of where we are. We have a number of important clinical studies that are coming out. Um, I know that there is an understandable impatience on the part, particularly of parents of young children, to know what the implications of some of these studies are.
and I think it's just as important that we take the time to make sure that we understand what these results mean, put them in context. So we need to understand what the preclinical and bench work means in context of some of the clinical and epidemiology and population health work, and also look at what some of these very new, very recent population-based studies mean in terms of what we know in terms of the, uh, the basic science and the bench science. Probably the next area that requires work now is to integrate and synthesize all the information we have and to start talking with policymakers and stakeholders about what this means for practice. Um, I think given the rapidity with which the work has been advancing, this is going to happen relatively soon. And having seen this work from fairly early on in its inception, in, uh, in the beginning of the concern about this particular issue, I am absolutely confident that we're going to be narrowing in on a, a good, valid, and reliable response, and that we can inform clinical practice in a way that ensures the safety of children that require anesthetic exposure. Uh, Smart Tots has uh, played an important role in my research by uh, giving us the initial funding to pursue this question uh, in trying to determine the effect of comorbidity as well as the uh, dose response between exposure and uh, outcome. And in addition to my work, Smart Tots has also funded a number of other researchers who are asking equally important questions in trying to evaluate the impact of anesthetics on uh, long-term cognition and trying to uh, answer this question of neurotoxicity. My name is Vesna Yevtovich Todorovic and I'm a practicing anesthesiologist at the University of Colorado Department of Anesthesiology School of Medicine. About 15 years ago, We've discovered that an early exposure to commonly used general anesthetics when given to very young animals causes very significant changes in their brain development. The changes vary in scope and nature based on when exactly they're exposed to anesthesia, but very important outcome of these experiments and this, this research led us to understand that anesthetics, when given very early during brain development, affect the development of behavior and learning in these animals. The changes that we noticed were not only long-lasting, but they seemed to be progressively worse as the animal got older, where the gap between the animals not exposed to anesthesia and the ones exposed to anesthesia early on became wider as they got older. Importantly, the effect on learning and cognitive development affected high uh, functions that we call executive functions, meaning that, that these animals could not complete complex cognitive tasks. This is what got us quite concerned because these are the anesthetics that we use in everyday um, anesthesia practice, and therefore we wanted to further investigate whether the changes that we discover the animals would apply to humans. Based on our understanding of how general anesthetics cause harm to a very young brain, we've been developing different methods for ameliorating these harmful effects. There are many agents that are approved at the moment for use in laboratory and clinical settings that we've tried with animals and discover that they are very successful in preventing anesthesia-induced harm to the brain. However, we still have a long ways to go before we can introduce those techniques in our clinical practice. Based on the findings in animal studies, we realized that we need to focus on examining whether that phenomenon exists in humans. Therefore, many retrospective studies and some rapidly emerging prospective studies are actively looking at this phenomenon 
to see whether this is unique just to animals or whether it applies to humans as well. Based on early findings that we have that are mainly retrospective, we are beginning to suspect that potentially an early exposure to anesthesia could have long-term implications on learning and memory development in humans as well. For short exposures, uh, it appears that there is no link based on currently available studies between an early exposure to anesthesia and cognitive problems later on in life. Of course, further studies are necessary before we can confirm that to be the case. Our concern right now is focused on longer exposure to anesthesia, in particular longer than a couple of hours, because there appears to be a link between um, longer and multiple exposures and cognitive impairments later on in life. Uh, there is a great interest by the FDA to further investigate this uh, potential problem that we are being faced with so that we can come up with most appropriate approach. Since anesthesia exposure is not a matter of choice and often is urgency or emergency, we have to come up with a way to administer anesthesia to our kids that is going to provide them with proper uh, cognitive development while providing the care that they need. With regard to the question of neurotoxicity, uh, there's a reasonable body of evidence in the animal research showing that there's an association or even a uh, causal association between exposure to anesthesia and histological changes as well as functional changes in animals. Now, with humans, there's a growing uh, amount of evidence as well in the observational studies showing that children who require surgery and anesthesia at a young age also have long-term cognitive differences compared to children who don't need surgery and anesthesia. In human studies, there is a growing number of observational studies finding that humans who or children who are exposed to anesthesia at a young age have long-term differences compared to children who are not exposed to anesthesia uh, at that same age. Now, the, the problem with this is that we don't know if this is due to the surgery, the anesthesia, or other clinical factors that may be present in children who require surgery and anesthesia and children, uh, compared to children who do not need surgery and anesthesia. And this causal uh, relationship is not something that is easily uh, uh, identified using the observational studies. And this is where many prospective clinical trials may need to take over to move the, the field forward. With regard to the observational studies, there also appears to be some evidence that shorter exposures, uh, fewer exposures, may be associated with less uh, of a cognitive effect than longer exposures or multiple exposures. Now, again, uh, we still have to determine whether or not this is due to a dose effect, whether or not it's the anesthetic dose, or whether it's that children who require longer surgeries and multiple exposures are in some way different than children who either don't require surgery and anesthesia or children who require fewer episodes of surgery and anesthetics. Based on currently available evidence, I would encourage our parents to reach out to their anesthesiologists to, so that they can get individualized perspective on the best possible care for their child. Hello, my name is Ali Menson. I'm the uh, Director of Pediatric Endoscopy here at uh, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. However, there's also a fair amount of animal data which shows that uh, there are potential toxicities. So given that, and uh, our desire to do what's safest for all children, uh, any proceduralist, surgeon, uh, gastroenterologist, uh, whatever, we all need to be making sure that we're doing whatever we can to minimize uh, the exposure that children have to anesthesia uh, given the potential impacts.
Um, so again, what we're trying to do in uh, gastroenterology is one, make sure that uh, we're doing procedures for clinically indicated reasons. Um, uh, two, making sure that parents uh, of children that are undergoing multiple anesthesias understand that there may be a potential adverse uh, neurocognitive outcome in patients who are, are having multiple procedures done over that are, that are potentially uh, very long. Um, and then three, also trying to see if there are new and different ways of doing procedures uh, without anesthesia. Um, for example, using play therapy um, uh, uh, and clowns and things like that to try and see if we can do some minimally invasive procedures without using anesthesia at all. The Smart Tots website is a great opportunity for parents to uh, uh, get more information on this question of potential neurocognitive impairment in uh, children who are undergoing anesthesia. Uh, there are areas on the website where you can get your frequently asked uh, questions answered, um, in addition to many other resources. Uh, please check out the Smart Tots website.